Well, hey, this week we're in week two of our series that's called Life on Mission. Uh, And the reason that we are diving into this is because in my conversations with so many people, I, I find people who are confused, adrift, depressed, just trying to figure life out. And so many people, because they can't quite figure it out, they just accumulate more stuff, more things on their calendar. They try to accumulate more things into their checkbook and then spend more things. And, um, you know, they try to find joy in Amazon deliveries and everything else that's out there. But the reality is, is all of those things are fleeting and all of those things um, will not satisfy. And we find ourselves with a big whole in the center of our lives that we continue to try to fill. And I believe it's because most of us don't have a solid sense of mission. Uh, Last week, we talked about the fact that direction determines destination. That direction determines destination. We looked at the reality that if you get off course, even if just, even just one degree off course, that you, it won't take long for you to end up in a place that you never anticipated being. And you certainly won't end up where you planned to be or hoped you would be. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to just go to our website, um, look under the media tab, and you can watch last week's message. It was kind of the setup for all of this. But what happens is, is our trajectory, did I get it right today? All right, I've been practicing this week. Um, our trajectory, um, if, we, if we get that off, right, if we kind of see the target, but our t- trajectory, I'm working on it, um, is off, then we miss the target. And did you know in the Bible, the word for missing a target is the word we call sin, it, it, it sin uh, originally in the ancient world was what they called out when an archer would shoot at a target and miss. Uh, because why? Because he was just a little bit off, right? The minute you let go, that arrow is on a path, and so are we. And we want to end up somewhere. Everybody's going to end up somewhere, right? We just want you to end up there on purpose. Um, and, and so oftentimes what happens is we get way off course in the things we do. And, and it, you know, we, we're trying to figure out life. And um, it's kind of like we mess up on occasion because we get things just a little off. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen these memes about, um, you know, you only had one job. But it's really great. Like the guy who was supposed to install the handrail, right? And I don't know if you can really see this, but that is definitely not going in the right direction, right? He assumes that you're going to grow as you walk downstairs, right? Um, or there's the guy who can't quite handle the, uh, painting the lines in the middle of the, of the highway, right? You only had one job, right? Just, just get the yellow lines in there right. Um, uh, this one, this one may be offensive to people like my grandsons. Um, this one, um, come on, really? I mean, really? Like, do you, do you, do you even know? Like, and some of you are going, what's wrong? What's wrong? Right? Yeah. That's the Batman symbol. Come on. So, um, yeah. Um, or then there's this guy who was supposed to just install, install the toilet, um, where the toilet paper went in, in his stuff here, I think. Yeah. Like, you're going to reach that? Can I please get the toilet paper where I can not have to stand up to go get the toilet paper, right? That's just, that's just wrong in so many different ways. Or, or guys, guys, you will appreciate this one. There is just something so wrong about this. <laughs> can you imagine you just like, hey, how was it for you today? I don't know. Just like, you know, I mean, this is almost as bad as going in the troughs at Dodger Stadium, right? So, um, man. Um, and, and then this one, you know, you go in and you get your coffee. This one's awesome. It says, I said my name was Mark with a C. <laughs> right? We, we all, <laughs> oh man, I almost went into the coffee place this morning and said, hey, can you put Mark with a C on there and just see what they, see what they would do. But you know, we, um, I, I believe that the reason that so many of us, um, just go through life and we're missing the mark, right? We're, we're just off a little bit. 
um, we, or we, we just feel like something is missing. We feel like there's something more. And we talked about that last week. And, and all, of you, all of you agreed, right? How many of you agree? There, there just feels like there's something more in life, right? Okay. All right. I'm waking you up this morning. You got to participate, right? There's something more, right? Or that, um, or it, they're just, uh, it, things just aren't the way that they're supposed to be. And, and, and I think it's because oftentimes we're, we're just living just off a tick, right? We're just off direction in just a little bit, a little degree off. And we're living without or we're living with the wrong mission. And many of us have spent little to no time thinking about our personal mission. I mean, when you think about it, uh, uh, most of us, uh, you know, if you have a job, most of you have a mission, right, at work. And in fact, most of your companies have a mission statement, and we're going to talk a lot about mission statement stuff today. But, but what about you? What about you personally? Do you have, have you thought much about your personal mission? what you're supposed to accomplish. You see, most of us are too busy dealing with the immediate, the urgent tasks to think about what we want to do in this life or where we want it to end up. And intuitively, we sense our direction is off. And what we know is this, if our direction's off, then so will our destination be. As a result, we might feel a level of discomfort, a level of confusion, maybe just downright depression because we're trying to figure it out. We know the way that we are living is not working fully, but we're not sure why. And like I said, businesses have mission statements. Um, like, for instance, um, Disney, pretty popular brand, right? Disney's, uh, they have a big mission statement. It says, to entertain, inform, and inspire people around the globe through the power of unparalleled storytelling, reflecting the iconic brands, creative um, minds, and innovative technologies that make ours the world's premier entertainment company. And I'm like, that's a mouthful, right? But when you look at it, that's what they're after, Right? That's what they're after. Um, uh, Chipotle. How many of you like Chipotle? All right. I know. Now I made you hungry. You're wa- waiting for church to get over already. I love Chipotle's. Chipotle's is really simple. To change the world by serving great food. I'm like, I like that. And I like Chipotle. So, you know, that's good. So, um, th- but then I like Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity says this. Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. I'm like, that's good. I like, I like that, right? Now, if we're going to live on mission, we need to first know the mission, right? And continually adjust our direction so that we will end up in the right destination. So we need to know the mission and then we have to make constant course corrections so that we stay on mission. That's the most important part. Um, uh, leadership uh, guru uh, Peter Drucker says this, Every day you need to ask yourself two questions. What business are we in and how's business? Right? Two questions. What business are we in and how is business? I think this can apply great for us individually and for the church, right? What business are we in and how's business? Now, um, and, and I think this is important. Did you know, because did you know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. I mean, God has a plan. We just sang about the fact that he has a good, good plan for your life. But so many of us are missing out on God's good plan because we've either tried to kind of like hijack the plan and say, okay, this is my plan because it's my life, right? Or we just don't, we, we're just busy doing whatever the world tells us to. And so we're not really concerned about like, what, what the mission is, we're just like out for the next thing that's standing right in front of me. Like I got decisions to make right now today and I'm just, I'm just trying to survive doing that. Uh, you know, and, and now pastor, you're telling me I got to have like this long-term mission thing. Here's the great news. If you pay close attention, it's already done for you. We just have to pick it up and make it part of our life. Ephesians chapter 2, 10 says this, for we're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. There's a couple of really important words in there. Number one, it says, um, we are God's 
Handiwork. You might just circle the word handiwork, right? In, if, if, if you're taking notes. Handiwork. Um, and, and that word for handiwork, it's this word poema, which really means something that was, that was created by hands. So it's like a homemade product, right? Now, the other word that's right next to it is created. And actually, a lot of, a lot of times when you, I hear the sermon, I hear a lot of people spend a lot of time on this word poema, which means like created with hands. But the word for created, kidzo, okay, it, it, it mean, it's exclusively used for divine creation. That something from nothing that was never created before. Think about that. Something that God created from nothing, but is unlike anything he's ever created before. You know what that says about that? Like, you're God's handiwork. He used his hands to make you, right? The, the, in the Old Testament in Genesis says he formed us. Psalms reiterates that as he knit us together, right? Knitting, you know, you use your hand. And, and God created us. He formed us, right? But he made us, okay, like nothing he'd ever made before. That means he made you unique. And while you're unique, you have a unique way of doing things. You have unique gifts and everything else, but you have a mission. So he says, so you've been made, you've been made unique. And then he says, by Christ, in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what does that tell you about your mission? God has a plan and it's prepared for you. And the problem is, is you think you've got to figure it all out. You are spending most of your time trying to figure out something that will get you in the wrong destination. Does that make sense? Right? God has already prepared a plan, a purpose, and a path for you, but you just have to embrace it. What we've got to quit doing is saying, hey, this is my life. I'm, I got to figure it out and I got to create my thing. No, you just have to listen to what God has in store for you and apply what his plan and purpose is to your life and then you will be fulfilled. Now, God has his plan and purpose in your life and until we discover that mission and allow it to direct our life, you'll be living in the wrong direction. And wrong directions then wrong direction ends up at the wrong what? Destination. Okay, good. You guys are listening. So, how will we discover the mission that God has for us, right? And then the bigger question is, will, will you accept the mission, right? You guys, how, how many Mission Impossible fans in the room? Yeah, like how many of you old school Mission Impossible, or like TV show, right? You remember that one, right? And, and you remember every, every Mission Impossible starts off with the same thing. And, and you know, you've got, the, you've got the mission, right? And it always starts out, this mission, should you choose to accept it? And do you know in all my years of watching the TV show and the movies and everything else, no one ever said no. <laughs> Nobody ever looked and went, yeah, no, man, I'm not, no, 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 not doing that, right? Because that would make for a really short movie. So what happens is like, and then what happens in it, it, like this mission, like it will self-destruct, right? Whatever it was that got there. And, and it's because it's, why? Because it's not that hard. It's not, it, you can remember this. And so we want to dive into that today. Now, to, in order to dive in and look at it, I want us to look at um, a teaching of Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 um, it'll be on the screens. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. It's a big chunk of scripture. It's a, a parable that you've probably heard before, but I, I just want you to listen and, and start listening with ears trying to pick up the mission, right? What's the mission? So it starts in um, uh, chapter uh, 25, verse 14, actually, and it says this. It says, again, it will be, and Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God, by the way. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. If I was taking notes in my Bible, which I did, circle the word his. Whose wealth is it? His wealth, right? Okay, just, again, just remember that. Then in verse 15, it says, to the one, he gave five bags of gold. To, the, uh, to another, he gave two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his own, each according to his ability. 
So there was a plan, there was a reason, right? Because God knew them, God created them, God had a mission for them, so each according to their own ability, God gave them what they needed to do the job he was calling them to do. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Uh, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and, to, and settled accounts. That's a big circle, settled accounts, right? Settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear that someday? Yeah? Yes. That's what we all long for, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Now come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew. Everybody circle, I knew, right? He knew what was up. He knew what he was supposed to, right? I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I was afraid. And I went out and hid your, circle your, right? Your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I had not sown and gathered where I did not scatter seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He did not end up in the destination that he thought he was gonna end up in, did he? He thought he was playing it safe. He was trying to save his life rather than lose it, right? And so he, so he acted in fear. And so, um, so in this parable, we, we have the master, right? That represents God. And the servants, who's the servants represent? If, if it's a parable, who, who are the servants? Yeah, everybody raise your hand. So, yeah, there you go. That's who it is, right? We're the servants, all right? And he entrusts, right? He entrusts his wealth to them. Remember, his wealth. He gives them his wealth. And he gives it to them according to their ability. So again, he knows them. He knows what the plan is. He knows what he's created them to do. He would not give it to them if he did not intend them to use it. Right? If he thought that they couldn't do anything, he wouldn't have given them anything. But he gave them something. And immediately... Okay, immediately the first two servants, they get to work. These guys are on mission, right? And what's interesting, if you really pay attention to the parable, what's interesting is the master does not give them any instructions. Do you notice that? He just gives them the money, says, here you go. He didn't give them any instructions. He, he, did, he does not tell the servants with the five bags of gold, hey, here, here's, a, here's the deal, go invest in Amazon, Right? He, he didn't look at the guy with the two bags of gold and say, hey, go, go, in, go, go buy some condos on the Sea of Galilee. Those are going to go up in value, right? Now, why, do you, why don't you think he needed to tell the servants what to do? Have any thought? Because the servants knew the master's business. They were part of the business all the time with him. They knew what the master's, the, the master's mission statement was probably written all over the house. And they knew what the master was all about. So they didn't need further instructions. Folks, when it comes to mission, 
We don't need to guess. We don't need to wait for a word from the Lord. He has already spoken, and I like what Tony Evans say. He did not stutter. If we are followers of Jesus, he made our mission very clear. One of the first things business leaders tell us when you're trying to develop your mission statement for your life or for your business is to start with the end in mind, right? Start with what the most desirable end is supposed to be. And then you work backwards, right? You, you kind of reconstruct it backwards to where you are, and then that gives you the path to get there. The good news for us is that we have a picture of God's end goal. Do you realize that? We have a great picture. One of the best pictures of this is in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And it says this. It's pretty amazing. This is like in heaven, right? John gets a, a see in heaven. He says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, people, and language were holding palm branches in their hands. And then it tells us that they were sitting before the Lord and they were singing, right? So this is a picture of what happens in heaven. There are people there from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, and they're standing there before the throne of the Lamb of God. God is on mission. Now this is, pay close attention to this. God is on mission to redeem people from every tribe, every nation, every people, and every language. That is God's Number one mission, hands down, bar none, full stop, right, is redeeming people's eternities. That is God's ultimate mission. And God's mission became Jesus' mission. In, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Why was Jesus here? Was Jesus just here to turn some water into wine, feed a bunch of people with some, you know, loaves and fish? Was he just here to walk on some water? What, what was Jesus here for? Jesus' whole reason for coming to earth could be boiled down into this one sentence. He came to seek and to save the lost. Everything he did was about that. And when Jesus called his first followers... What did he tell them they were going to do? What was their chief mission? Do you remember what it was when, they, when Jesus first meets his first disciples? What, what, was, it, was it, hey, uh, if you follow me, then you're going to build some nice homes, build some nice churches, develop some nice programs? No? Uh, somehow, I just don't think, it, I, I think it would not suffice if they would have just put a Jesus fish sticker on the side of their boat and kept on fishing. I just don't think that would have worked. Jesus said that they needed to follow him and he would make them fishers of men. They didn't become apprentices of Jesus just so that they could learn to be nicer people or cleaned up versions of themselves. They didn't follow Jesus just to become respectable citizens. In fact, they turned the world upside down. Why? Because they lived on mission. And their mission came into direct conflict with the mission of most of the rest of the world. They followed Jesus and it upset their lives. And I, I, I'm here to tell you this this morning. This, this is not the easy message to hear today. Is man, if, if you really go on mission with Jesus... It's going to interrupt some of your plans. If you truly live out mission the way Jesus calls you to mission, it will mess with your life. But here's the thing, that nagging feeling of wondering, like, is, is, is this really all there is to life? Or, hey, it, it, you know, there just seems like there's something missing in my life. I think there's more. Or, hey, I wonder if I'm supposed to be doing this, but that just doesn't feel... All of those things, those things go away when you're on mission for Jesus. No, they, they follow Jesus and it cost them their very lives. And like Devin read earlier, 
if you're not willing to lay down your life, you'll never experience the mission that God fully has for you. And so Jesus passes on this mission to them and to us. And then here's what he told them. And he told us, he says, Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Did you catch that? Who, all authority in heaven, where our, our destination, right? We hope there, but on earth too. All authority in heaven and on earth. So he has all authority everywhere. And so what does he say? Because I have all authority, okay, because I am the guy with the plan, he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Right? He, he didn't say, hey, go and get your best life now. Unless that is making disciples. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Our mission is to go and make disciples, baptizing them. That means helping them find Jesus, right? That's why one, a part of our mission statement here, helping people find Jesus, and then teaching them everything he's commanded, helping them follow Jesus. Our mission, to help people find and follow Jesus, right? This was not our idea. We didn't lock ourselves in a room and go, gee, what are we supposed to do here, Right? We opened up the word of God and said, this is what Jesus wants us to do here. We are here to help people find and follow Jesus, to help, to baptize them, bring them to Jesus, and help them follow Jesus, right? To, to, our, our goal is to expand. This is what Jesus' goal was. It was the disciples' goal, and now it's our goal, is to expand his kingdom by helping redeem people for an eternity with him. When we talk, we're supposed to have on earth as it is in heaven, right? What is in heaven? We just read it. People bowing before the throne. That's the mission, folks. Okay? Having the kingdom, we have this idea that like, oh, if the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, then I get a palace. Right? Mm Mm-mm. What's happening in heaven is there are people bowing before the throne of grace, worshiping and adoring God, living for eternity. No pain, no sorrow, no depression, no guilt, no shame, all of those things. I mean, that is the mission, is to get people into an eternity with Jesus. Can somebody say amen this morning? All right. Or are you so shocked I said it's gonna mess up your life? Yeah. So, The Apostle Paul put it this way in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He says, I don't care about my own life. Who says that today, right? This is the Apostle Paul. I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. There's Paul's mission statement, right? So whose mission is it ultimately? I think in relation to the story we read earlier, it's God's mission, right? God has a mission. He's he's calling you into it. He's saying, hey, here's the mission. Join me in this. What an amazing thing. God's saying, come on with me. He's got a plan and a purpose. It's God's mission, but he makes it our mission. Now, I heard this. This is really interesting. Why doesn't God just take us to heaven right when we accept Jesus? Wouldn't that be better? All right, you just, you just, you accept Jesus and he's like, all right, got one, come home. Right? Why? Why does God leave us here with all the struggle and the pain and he knows that the world's going a different direction than, than he wants us to go and everything else? Why doesn't God just take us home? It's because he has work for us to do here. Right? It's not for you to be comfortable here. Let me let that sink in for a minute. God has left us here not so that we would have the most comfortable life here. Not so that you could accumulate some stuff here. Not so that you could just like enjoy everything you want here. He left us here because there is a mission for us to accomplish. And he is inviting you 
to be part of that. And why is this so important? The population of the United States of America, as of yesterday sometime, was 341,143,986. I know for sure it made it to 87 because uh, our nephew just had a, their little girl last night was born. So, it, it, so it's going up, right? It's going up all the time. But a Pew Research Survey estimates, estimates that there's over 180 million people living in our country that do not know Jesus. Which, folks, makes the United States of America probably the third or fourth largest mission field in the world. We keep thinking we're supposed to send people over there to do mission work. And I'm telling you, he has you here to do mission work. This is the greatest, maybe the most difficult mission field in the world. You know why? Because there's a lot of people that aren't convinced they need saving. And I'm afraid that a lot of those people are sitting in our churches. And they believe that their mission is just to like, you know, be, be nice and comfortable and be good, nice people and be good citizens and be nice to our neighbors and do nice things. And, you know, yes, we're supposed to be loving and kind and gracious and all those things. But those things are to draw people closer to us so they go, what is different about you so you can tell them about Jesus? That's the goal. It's not just to be nice people. Everywhere these apostle guys went, riots broke out. They were on their way to one city and the people were like, oh my gosh, these people that have turned the world upside down, they're coming here too. Right? Well, I don't know why. Every time I show up, it's like people want to serve tea and cookies. <laughs> like, I, I want to show up somewhere and not, like have some crazy things happen, right? Like these guys I read about in the Bible. Just like any story, or just like in our story, who gives the resources to make this happen? The master, right? God gives the resources. We get caught up thinking like, we got to accumulate. We got to come up with the resources. God gives us the resources. It says, uh, then he gave us, so he gave us gifts, okay, the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us, to gift us, to convict us, to teach us, to fulfill the mission. Again, our goal is not to have a nice, safe life now right? I, I love this quote. The goal of this life is not to safely arrive at death. Think about it. But that's the American way, right? To safely arrive at death. So you make sure that you got enough money so you don't run out before you die. You make sure you got all the right health things in place so that, that, you know, so that's nice and easy. So even death is nice and easy. The goal of life is not to safely arrive at death, folks. The goal of this life is to be on mission with Jesus. And we wonder, why is it that I think I'm missing something here? And Jesus gives us all the resources that we need to make this happen. I mean, think of all the resources that God has put at your disposal. He's given you talents, your natural gifts and abilities. He's given you spiritual gifts, right? That's what the Bible says. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have spiritual gifting, God empowerment to do things for his kingdom. He's given you a job. Oh, you think you got that, right? But the Bible tells us that God is the one who gives us the ability to work and to make money, which, by the way, he gave you some of that too, he gave you a home, right? No matter what it looks like. He gave you education. We're still, we're, we're the most, I, I was reading, I was thinking about this this way. I'm like, we're the most educated but off mission people in the world. He gave us education. He gave us experience. He gave us passions. He gives us relationships. He, all these things, these are things are gifts for God, not just for our enjoyment but so that we can go on mission. And the problem with most of us is that we think those things are the end game. We think that 
the home and the money and the job and the, the, the power and the prestige and the accolades and the trophies and all the, we think those are the end game. But the end game is actually being on mission with God to help people find and follow Jesus. I mean, think for a minute. Think for a minute, if all those things that you thought were supposed, that you were supposed to accumulate, all those things that you thought made life, you know, what it's supposed to be, imagine standing before Jesus one day, imagine you you show up to heaven and you've got a box, right? And you show up with a box and you have all the things that you accumulated in your life and you walked up to Jesus and you started pulling those things out like you were going to impress Jesus, right? Jesus, did you check out my diplomas? How about my trophies, Jesus? You know, hey, hey, Jesus, did you did you see this? Did, Jesus, did you what? What about this job that I got? What about this house that I have? What about these cars that I drove? What about all this stuff? What if you just showed him like pictures of all the cool places that you went and all these other things and go, look, Jesus, how do you think Jesus would respond to all that? I wonder if Jesus might look at us and go, like, so what mission were you on? I think he might look in the, I might think he might keep digging in the box and go, where are the souls? Folks, if we got a lot of stuff, but our, our, our relationships are a wreck, we're probably not living on mission. If your kids have shelves full of trophies and great college degrees and great jobs and everything else, but they're not following Jesus, then folks, somebody wasn't living on mission. The resources that we have in this life are not bad things. But unless you are using them to live on mission, they're distracting you from the mission. And that's the devil's greatest scheme. He will keep giving you all that stuff and telling you you've got to accumulate it so he can distract you from the real mission. So he gives us our mission, he resources our mission, but then we're accountable. Just like the guys in the story, remember the master returns and Jesus will return one day, right? And and we keep thinking, oh, when Jesus returns, we're just, boom, we go to heaven, everything's good. Do you realize that when that all happens, right, they call call it like, we're gonna stand before the Lord, right? There is a reckoning. There is accountability coming. And I love it for the servant that lives on mission. He says this, the master replies, well done, good and faithful servant. We all want to hear that. You have been faithful with a few things, right? Your earthly stuff, you've been faithful there. He says, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Did you notice that well done does not mean you're done? We think, oh, when we hear well done, then, oh, I'm done, man. Uh, where, you know, where's my golf course in heaven? Uh, Lord, where's my, where's my mansion? Where's all this stuff? Well done is just a beginning. Because he says, oh, you were faithful with some. I'm going to give you more. You, you ever seen that before in the Bible? Like, well done doesn't mean you're done. It actually means there's more to do. I don't know what that is in heaven, but God's got some plans for you there too. And, but the real reward is this. He says, the real reward is to share your master's happiness. Whose happiness is that, by the way? Yeah, it's his happiness. He, we get to share in it. Now, what do you think brings the master the most happiness? Anybody, right? How about this, Luke 15, 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people, that would be all us, right, we think, um, who don't need to repent. What is the master's happiness? Souls being saved for eternity. That's the master's happiness. But what about the servant who was afraid? He took the, what the master gave him and he failed to use it for the master's purposes. He did not live on mission. He just held on to it. He tried to live the safe life. 
thinking, I know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hang out here till the master returns. I'm just gonna make sure I don't do anything wrong, right? Most of you are too busy trying to make sure you don't do anything wrong. Rather than risking it all on the mission that God has called you to. And let me tell you something. If all you do is try to protect what you've got and stay safe and just focus on don't doing, don't, not doing anything wrong, you will live a very, very boring life filled with fear, filled with regret, filled with depression and disillusion and all those things. Because the one who tries to save his life will lose it. And what happened to him? Well, his safe plan didn't turn out to be so safe. You see, folks, every day you need to ask yourself two questions. What business are we in? And how's business? So I want to spend just a, a few closing minutes sharing with you, helping you actually start, okay, this is just the beginning of this, start to write a personal mission statement, okay? The, and, and I think if you can start to get this down, and it will change, it will morph, you will, you will adjust it, right, um, over time. Um, you'll keep working on this and keep honing this, right? But, but you, it, a personal mission statement will help you stay on mission, keep you focused, be able to say no, to the things that the world's trying to drag you into, it will also, if you will let it, it will help you see everything that you have, okay, in relationship to the mission. So that I can look at all my stuff, right? I can look at all my relationships in regard to the mission. I can look at all my house and my cars, everything I have in relationship to the mission. I can look at my money in relationship to the mission. I can look at my children in relationship to the mission. Not who the world says that they're supposed to be, but who God says they're supposed to be. And I can put, if I have a good solid mission statement, then I can make sure that everything I have and everything that I do aligns itself under that mission. And when I do that, there will be purpose and fulfillment in life that you cannot possibly imagine. So here's a couple questions. For, well, well, first of all, I, I love this. There's lots of different mission statements that people um, have written. Some of you know who Richard Branson is, right? The guy who owns Virgin American and all this stuff. The guy who like tr goes around the world in balloons and things like that. His mission statement is to have fun in my journey and learn from my mistakes. Boom. I'm like, well, okay. Hope that balloon doesn't pop. But here, here's a few questions for you. And, and, and I, I'm going to do this. Um, I, I, I kind of created this video that I think will help. You have the questions on your little sheet that hopefully you got. Um, and, and so what I want you to do is I want you to start thinking about these things. Again, we're not going to finalize this today. I want you to take this home. I want you to work at it. I want you to work at it with your, if you're in a life group, which I hope you are. If you're not in a life group, I want you to get with someone and say, hey, let's, we're going to share this together. If you're not in a life group, you need to be in a life group, right? And if you are in one, then bring this to your life group this week and you guys can talk about how you're doing with this, right? Because this is super important because here's the thing. You could go on having a missionless life and you'll just be confused and you'll keep thinking something's missing or why isn't there more and all this other stuff or you can live on mission. So here's how to create a personal mission statement. Here's some questions that you need to ask. And we're, the first is this, who is God calling you to be? The second question is, what unique abilities, gifts, and resources has God given you? Third question, what are, your, what are you passionate about? Fourth question, what do you want to accomplish? Now, according to the who is God calling you to be, this is what I put, these are my answers, this is what I put down. I'm a husband, a father, I'm a grandfather, leader, pastor, I'm a friend. You can put more right? Then what unique abilities, gifts, and resources has God given you? Um, some of my spiritual gifts, I put some of those down first, teaching, leading, uh, I, building, I build stuff, um, education, I've been blessed with that, encouraging people, um, those are part of the, God's giftedness that he gave me. Then what are you passionate about? Super passionate about my family, about serving, 
about adventure. I love adventure. Um, what do you hope to accomplish? Helping people take the next step, helping people experience the adventure of following Jesus. Okay, that's just the stuff that I put down. You, you've got to write your own. That, one last question. How will you align your life with God's mission of reaching others for Christ? And here, this is just what I put down is I just, it's pretty simple. Leading family and others, right, to Jesus, okay? Teaching God's word. That, it was that simple for me. Now, you pull all those things together, you start circling things that are in common, and you develop a personal mission statement right? Now, I, this is going really fast, I know, but uh, just don't worry. You got, you'll have lots of time. Here's, this is what I came up with, my personal mission statement, okay? And you want it to be in the personal and in the present, okay? Not what you're going to do later, but this is what I'm going to do now. And here's what I came up with for mine after circling things and kind of melding it all together is this. I live a life, oh man, <laughs> really? good thing I got it written down. There's not a way to get that back up on there probably, is there? Ah, there we go. All right. Well, we'll start there. I live a life that stewards all I have for the sake of the kingdom of God, leading my family, friends, and others to Jesus and encouraging them to take their next step in adventurously following him. Okay. That's my mission statement. So I, I can say, hey, with everything that I have, that's that steward all I have, right? Like, am I, am I taking what I have been given, whether it be my house, my education, my relationship, am, am I leveraging those for the kingdom of God? Or am I just trying to get more stuff for me? Right? A am I encouraging people to take their next step? To adventurously, okay, and the reason I put that in there is because way too many people are just sitting there trying to follow Jesus. I happen to believe it's a great adventure. And I want people to adventurously follow Jesus, right? Because here's what I know. When you give your life to the mission of God and spend your life on behalf of other people, helping them find and follow Jesus, you will find purpose, peace, and you will get to share in your master's happiness. We've got serve day coming up. Um, I, I just, I love serve day because it's part of that. I want to serve other people. Uh, we have a trip to Mexico coming up. I hope you come next week and eat lots of tacos and help us raise funds for that. You know why? Because it's an opportunity. And we don't, we don't go down to Mexico to build a house just so people have a house. We go down so that an entire neighborhood of people go, who are these crazy people? Adventure, right? Who are these crazy people? What are they doing? So that the pastors in that area can come over and say, these are people who follow Jesus and this is the way they do life. Do you want to know more about that? Right? That's what it's all about. And what I've discovered in life is this. I can spend a whole lot of time trying to get stuff for me. I can spend a whole lot of time trying to like figure out like what, what makes me happy and everything else. But what I've discovered is this. If I work really hard serving other people and working to help them find Jesus, if I serve on behalf of other people and wash a window, build a house, teach the Bible, if, if I'm helping them find and follow Jesus, God fills my life with this overwhelming contentment and peace and I don't need the rest of the junk the world has to offer. So if you want to fill the hole that is at the center of your life, wondering why isn't there more, or what am I supposed to do? Align yourself with the mission of Jesus, and you will find the fulfillment your soul is longing for.
If you're here today and you want some prayer, I'm going to ask our elders, our leaders to just come up and sit up front and some of you can pray. If some of you need to take some time and really grapple with some of those questions, but whatever you do this week, work on aligning your life with the mission of Jesus. You will not regret it. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have blessed us with. But Father, help us to realize that you didn't bless us with it so that we could just be happy having it. You blessed us with everything that we have, everything from the breath in our lungs and the voices that we have to our homes and our relationships and our resources and everything else. God, you bless us with those things so that we can bless other people by helping them find real life in Jesus. So Father, thank you that we that we know you and that you are the source, that you are the provider, that you are the one who has called us into this great mission. Father, help us not waste our life on lesser things, but to join you in your mission and enjoy your happiness. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.